Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna, uh, for the wonderful welcome. And a very good day to everyone. And thank you for joining uh, this interesting webinar. Welcome to the Air for Good Machine and 5G Challenge webinar session. My name is Thomas Pascoe from the International Telecommunications Union, ITU. The Machine and 5G Challenge aims to create community that solve network related problems using AI and machine learning. And today I'm very excited to host a webinar that is also going to launch uh, a challenge, one of the challenges for 2023. This is the Graph Neural Networking Challenge 2023, and the title is Building a Network Digital Twin Using Data from Real Networks. And in this uh, competition or in this challenge, participants will be challenged to develop for the first time ever a graph neural network based network digital twin using a data set from a real network. So in, ad in addition as well, uh, our host will provide key insights on how to approach this challenge. So as always, we are counting on you, uh, anyone or participants that are joining this webinar to help create an engaging discussion. So if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A and any other type of communications, please put them in the chat. I would, at this point in time, I would like to introduce the speaker for the session today or for this webinar. Uh, the speaker is Professor Albert Cabellos. He is a full professor at University Polytechnic of Cat Catalonia in Spain. In 2019, he co-founded the Barcelona Neural Network, uh, Barcelona Neural Networking Center, where he is the director. So the Barcelona Neural Networking Center has, has been created with the, the main goal of carrying fundamental research in the field of graph neural networks applied to computer networks and education training the new generation of students. So it is an honor to have Professor Albert with us. The graph neural networking challenge has been there with us for the past three years. So this is the fourth year, fourth iteration of the competition. Thank you so much, Albert, for joining and for posing this challenge for the past three years. Good afternoon. Thank you, Thomas, for your very kind introduction. So let me share my screen. OK, I guess that now, now you can see my slides. Yes. OK, so uh, thank you, Thomas. So um, as Thomas said, uh, I'm going to present the Graph Neural Networking Challenge, this edition, 2023 which is titled uh, Building a Network Digital Twin Using uh, Data from Real Networks. Uh, and the key here is Real Networks. I will be um, presenting the challenge. And then uh, Carlos uh, Güemes, he's a PhD candidate uh, here at UPC, who has been working a lot on this challenge and doing fantastic contributions. He will do kind of a live demo. Um, so let me start uh, then the presentation. Um, so uh, what is the Graph Neural Networking Challenge? So just as Thomas uh, said, this is a, an annual competition of, uh, of challenges, uh, which is related about uh, around Graph Neural Networks. And this is the fourth edition. And I will say that uh, all the editions have been quite successful, at least in terms of participation. And uh, we have been dealing with different aspects which are very fundamental on how to use Graph Neural Networks into computer networks. And actually, uh, I believe that they have been uh, quite popular challenges, both in the AI community and in the networking community. And uh, as far as we know, this is uh, this is the first and only competition on GNNs applied to computer networks. And well, GNNs is a hot topic in AI. 
uh, and it is becoming a hot topic in, in networking too. And we are starting to see quite a bunch of papers uh, um, appearing on, on that front. Of course, and as Thomas said, uh, the challenge is orga organized uh, with the help of our good friends at I2T, uh, especially uh, Thomas and Vishnu, uh, although I'm sure that there are many other people working there. Um, and uh, this is the framework over which we organize the challenge, and, and it's, it's very helpful uh, for us. Um, so the challenge this year, we are offering two cash prizes. Uh, the first one for the winner of the challenge, it is 2,000 euros, and the second prize is uh, 500 euros. So um, this is uh, what we will offer to, to the winner of the challenge. Now let me... Uh, put a little bit of context on what is the challenge about. And the, the challenge is about building, um, the title is Building a Network Digital Twin Using Data from Real Networks. So let's start by uh, what is a Network Digital Twin. So uh, a Network Digital Twin is, uh, a digital twin in general, it's kind of a virtual replica of a physical object. So you can you can think of it as, uh, in planes, it's quite intuitive, right? You have a plane, and then you can build a digital replica of that plane, and then you can use this digital twin to make some uh, reasonings. Uh, what will happen if there is a specific failure, for instance, in the electrical system? Or what will happen if I make a change in the object, like uh, I change the wing design? So instead of testing it with the real plane, you can test it on a digital twin and get some useful data. So digital twins are now very popular, and they are being developed for um, aviation, for healthcare, there are people talking about having digital twins of the heart or uh, other organs and so on. So it's quite a, a popular um, technique right now. So for networks, a network digital twin is pretty much the same. It's a virtual replica of a physical network. And here you have a very nice representation of that. Um, so basically, it, it is useful for the same uh, things. You can test what if scenarios. What will happen in my network if I change the configuration? Or what, what will happen if my network, if this antenna fails? Or um, how can I upgrade my network with the minimum cost to support a particular new application? Or what will happen with my network if I have more users than the ones I do have, if I expect a particular growth? So it's pretty much the same concept as a digital twin, but in this case, it's applied to computer networks. So how you can build a network digital twin? Um, uh, so there are many ways to do it, and um, right now there are several people which are proposing different ways to do it. A way to do that is to use graph neural networks. Um, I don't believe it's the only way, and I believe that the only the other approaches to building net network digital twins are also valid. But we have been focusing on graph neural network, and certain types of net network digital twins, I believe that you really need uh, graph neural network. So but before getting into that, I will introduce what are uh, graph neural networks. So Basically, a graph neural network is a class of artificial neural network which is used for processing graph data. Graph data. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that many of you already know there are different types of neural networks, right? You have convolutional neural networks, which, are, which is typically used to process image or video, or recurrent neural networks or transformers, which is typically used to, to process a text and speech and sequences. And uh, graph neural networks is kind of a new neural network. This was invented back in 2018 by the people at DeepMind, although there are other contributions for, from academics, uh, academia before that. But let's say that uh, since the paper of 2018, this, this became very popular. And it's basically a neural network used to process relational data, which is graph data. Since its invention, it has become a very a hot topic in AI, and it's a top trend in graph machine learning. Uh, finding new uh, cool applications of GNN. And as I was saying before, we are starting to see quite a few applications in very important venues such as SICOM of GNN applied to computer networks. And here on the right, you can see time is reversed. So time uh, past is on the right, future is on the left, uh, or present is on the left. You can see that there is an exponential growth in papers related to GNN. Because basically, we have a new tool to parse relational data and we are trying to, uh, many people are is trying to identify different applications for graph neural networks. Then, what is the state of the art in network digital twins? So um, now let's say that we want to build a network digital twin, right? Uh, and the first thing we need uh, before building a network digital twin is to understand what we want to model in this digital twin. And the, a way to see it is to understand um, the network as a black box, right? 
A network is something that you put traffic in, right? Traffic can be voice traffic, video traffic, data traffic, any type of traffic. And each traffic, of course, is a set of packets. And what you get on the outside is the packets which, which have been transmitted through this network, right? This is super simple. This network is typically uh, running with a particular configuration, which is typically uh, written by network administrators. So network administrators write a configuration and apply it to the network. The network is running with a particular state and then traffic is flowing through that network. Finally, this traffic has a certain performance, right? So traffic will have a particular delay. You can, you can uh, compute the delay per packet or in this case per flow where we are computing the delay per flow. Uh, losses, uh, flows will lose some packets in some scenarios. And also the network will have a particular, um, you, you, you will be able to measure the performance of a network, for instance, understanding which is the queue utilization over time of the different router and switches and the link utilization of the different router and switches. So this is quite, uh, quite basic. So the way we understand a network digital twin is a black box, which is a digital replica of that network where you put a description of the traffic and you get as an output the per, the per flow performance metrics, right? So exactly the same performance metrics. And you can also apply a particular configuration. So in this case, we see a network digital twin, kind of a simulator. You can think of it as a simulator, but we will build it using neural networks because this has many advantages, right? But just to be clear, the input is a description of the traffic. Um, the output is the performance of the traffic when flowing through that network. And then you have another input, which is the configuration for that network. So um, this digital twin will be useful for um, the same scenarios as I, was, as I was describing before. You can use it for uh, what if scenarios, what will happen if I change the configuration, what will happen if I have an increase of void traffic over, over my network, and you will always get the answer in terms of performance. So if you have an increase of voice traffic, maybe other traffic uh, will have a higher loss. So you will see that on the network digital twin, and you don't need to test it on the real network. Also, you can try new protocols or new configurations um, without impacting the real infrastructure and see what will be the performance. So this is the way we understand a network digital twin. So how you can build this actually, this network digital twin? Well, what you can do is you can take one network and pretty much as in any machine learning application, you can start generating data, right? So you, what, will you, what you will do is you will take an, uh, a network. This can be a simulated network or a real network, and you will start to test. Okay, I have this particular configuration. I have this particular traffic load, which can be uh, random. Those are the input labels. And uh, I'm measuring this particular performance, this delay, this jitter, and these losses. And then I apply a different configuration, which can be, again, random. You cannot generate it strictly random because probably th those will be unrealistic configurations, but you can generate them random from a set of realistic configurations. Then I will have this particular traffic load, any traffic load, uh, and I will have uh, I will measure this performance. So I'm starting to generate lots of uh, rows, uh, which is basically a data set. Once I have this data set, what I will do is I will train a neural network, which in our case, we train a graph neural network, which will have exactly the same inputs and outputs, right? We will have the traffic load and the configuration as an input and the performance of an out, as an output. And this is the way we build uh, network digital twins using graph neural networks. So the, um, the, um, one of the, the state of the art digital twin uh, right now, it's called RoundNet Fermi, and basically has all these input parameters and has these output parameters. So RoundNet Fermi is a graph neural network and as, a, as an input for the configuration, you can put, uh, which is a topology link capacity, also the routing that the, the packets are uh, following. Uh, you can assume that you have overlay or underlay protocols. You can, it can also support the scheduling policies, for instance, the strict priority or weighted fair, fair queuing or deficit RAM roaming uh, and so on. And then, and this is very important, I will insist on that, you, you will, uh, as an input, you will have a description of the traffic how many flows you have and which are the characteristics of the flow. But we are not using the real traffic as an input, but rather a description. I will explain this a little bit later. And as I, to, as I was explaining before, what you get as an output is the, the, the performance of these flows flowing through a network with this particular configuration, right? And this is useful for what if uh, analysis and so on. So as I was saying, the state of the art um, is uh, Ramnet Fermi. 
um, which, uh, and this is very interesting, and we are extremely happy about this. Rounded Fermi is not our work, but rather is the work of the community, because uh, after several iterations of the challenges, we have been um, asking participants to improve on the um, configuration on, on the capabilities of Roundnet through different challenges and through the knowledge that we have gathered after after three days edition, we have Roundnet Fermi. So at the beginning we have Roundnet and then we started to produce iterations of Roundnet. Each one has a letter um, and each letter uh, we name it after a famous scientist. So the last iteration is Fermi, before that we have Erlang uh, and so on. Um, the capabilities of Rowland Fermi are quite uh, outstanding because we are gathering the knowledge of a lot of people. Uh, it is able to scale to topologies 100 times larger than the ones seen in training. It supports arbitrary scaling policies, as I was saying before, and it supports traffic models as characteristics of the underlying interarrival distribution. It supports arbitrary traffic models, but it is very important to explain that the way Rowland Fermi understands traffic is by the moments of the distribution of the intra-arrival time, okay? Which means that, for instance, let's say that you have a flow and you say, okay, this flow is uh, exponentially distributed, meaning that the packets being transmitted uh, by this flow, the time between the packets is exponentially distributed and uh, defined by this particular lambda. So this lambda is the input of Ravnet Fermi. And then Ravnet Fermi supports pretty much, not all, but a lot of traffic models. So it's not only Poisson, but on off, um, Pareto, and many other distributions. But it, uh, the way it represents traffic is always through these moments of the distribution. And this is key for the challenge, as you will see. What are the main uh, limitations of Ronet Fermi? And this is what we are challenging people to, to solve. Uh, the main limitations, this first one, is that uh, data sets to train Ronet Fermi have been obtained from simulation. Always, always, always. All the iterations for, for, to generate the different versions of Rownet uh, was uh, the data sets came from a simulator, in this case, Omnet. Uh, Omnet is a packet accurate simulator. It's very accurate, but it is not a real network. And we all understand what are the difference between simulation and real networks. And the second is what I was saying before, is that traffic is generated uh, using stationary traffic distributions, Poisson on off, and the moments of, of such distributions were used as input to round, meaning that we generate these packets that you see here on the right, we generate these packets, and we input those packets into the simulator. And then we compute which is the delay for those packets, right? And then we describe those packets as the distribution of the inter-arrival times between the packets. In this case, it's an exponential distribution. And then lambda is the input to Ravnet, but not the packets themselves, right? Which we believe it's a limitation, and this is something we would like. We believe that it's important uh, to fix. So, uh, what we have done is we have built uh, to fix that. We have built uh, a data set coming from a, from a real network. Um, the data set, uh, the network is 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 made up of uh, two switches, two forty eight port switches four Huawei Net Engine routers, which are standard routers. Traffic is generated using T-Rex because of course we still need to generate traffic and this is a big, uh, big challenge. And the delay of the packet is measured with um, a certain type of hardware because you need to, because the delays are very small and you need to measure the delay with a high precision. That's why we need a specialized hardware to do that. And traffic is measured at the packet level, meaning that this data set has the packets going into the network and at, at the output, the packets egressing the network with the delay associated to that packet. Okay, so you have the full information of the of the network. Of course, you also have the configuration. So pretty much the data set includes everything that uh, that um, that represents a real network. The, the packets, the configuration of the network and the output packets with the delay associated to the packets. This is what we have um, been working in the last year. So now we are back to the to the challenge, and I believe that now the challenge is is pretty pretty straightforward to understand, or I hope so. So the problem statement is okay. We are asking people, we are challenging them on how to build a network digital twin with this real network data, right? So we have data from real real network, and we are asking, okay, can you generate the next iteration of Rownet? Um, we will provide you as a baseline Rownet Fermi 
but it is very important to understand that you are free to uh, extend round net Fermi or start from scratch. We are happy to receive new ideas and, and we don't want to limit anyone uh, and to create a path regarding Ravnet. No, no, no. Ravnet is, is, an, is an option that we are giving you. If, you. if you like it, that's fine. If you don't like it, that's also fine. You, you are free to choose whatever you, you want. And as I was saying, we will have two prices. The first one is 2,000 euros and the second one is 500 euros. So now let me provide you some insights on this data set. So as I was saying, the challenge is to, be, to build this network digital twin that can estimate the per flow mean delay based on the input per flow packet trace. So as an input, you, the model should receive the packets. And as an output, it should receive for each, it should produce for each flow, which is the mean delay of the packets associated to this flow. And of course, the topology and the routing configuration exactly the same as in the, stand, in the, starna, in the, starna, in the standard round. So the way the test bed works is we have kind of uh, four layers. We have uh, in one layer, we have all the routers. We have this uh, net engine router from Huawei. Then we have um, uh, two uh, switches, uh, which are interconnecting all the routers. Then we have the traffic generator, which for this we're using T-Rex, which is generating all the packets according to particular parameters. And then we have the traffic cap uh, capture, which is using DPDK through this, um, through this, uh, using this hardware to achieve a very good accuracy. So the way that the, the, the packets flow is traffic is generated at the generator, then it is sent through the switches. The switches are connected through the, sorry, traffic is, let me start again. Traffic is generated through um, by T-Rex, sent through a particular topology of the routers, which are connected in different ways. The routers uh, are connected through the switches. So it, it is going from the router to the switch and back to the router, then to another switch and then back to another router. And then back to the traffic generator. This is captured through, uh, by the traffic capture device, which will produce the delays. Okay. So here on the left, you have how the, the topology of the network. We have the traffic generator and through optical splitters, those links are copied, there is a physical copy of this traffic to the traffic cap capture. So the, the, the traffic capture is capturing the packets going into the network and going out on, of the network because the traffic generator is always the source and the destination. Okay, and then the traffic will go from the switch to the routers to another switch, and then finally back to the traffic generation and copy it through, through the, the traffic capture. Here on the right, I have a specific example. Let's say that we want traffic going from R1 to R5. What will happen is that first, the traffic uh, generator will produce the traffic. So this is the first step. This will be copied through an optical splitter to the traffic capture. So we will have access to the traffic as it was generated. Then it will go to the first switch. Then it will go to the first router, then back to the switch, then back to the other switch, then to router five, then back to the switch, back to the original switch, and then back to the traffic generation. Another physical copy through optical slip, slip, uh, splitters is, is is done, and finally the traffic capture has the ingress traffic at packet level and the egress traffic at packet level with the associated delay for each packet. So this is how it works. Then as a baseline, uh, as I was saying, we're offering, offering you RoundNet Fermi. Uh, RoundNet Fermi is kind of, a, I would say, quite complex graph networks network because it has been uh, um, iterated quite a few times. And we're offering you an open source implementation in TensorFlow, which you can find in, in this link. Um, uh, as I was saying, you can modify the baseline or start from scratch. You are free to choose any option. We, we are really winning the challenge. Uh, does not depend on that at all. And I will explain how you can win the challenge later. And uh, what we have done is that uh, we have um, changed the Dropnet Fermi to support the physical topology, both layer two and layer three of the testnet. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, all this complexity it is already being uh, solved by Ramnet Fermi, which already understands the, the, this topology. And um, as I was saying, you, if you want to use Ramnet Fermi, you should focus on that Ramnet Fermi does not support packet traces and input. So this is the first thing you should take care of. And then, and this we don't really know, maybe there are some characteristics of real networks which are not captured by Ramnet Fermi, but of course they are captured by the data set and you should also maybe you want to consider that. And just to give you an idea, 
the baseline, which is uh, if you train Ramnet Fermi with the data sets that we're offering, you will get more or less a 35% of uh, mapping. Okay, so now uh, let me explain a little bit the data set. Uh, the data set is quite large and it includes 10,000 samples and they are split into two different sets, uh, 5,000 uh, more or less each. Uh, the first one has two, di two different types of traffic, constant bit rate and multiverse, and the second one only includes multiverse. I will explain this a little bit later. And additionally, each sample contains for the flow information, which is the distribution of the packets, number of packets and packet size, the path information, which is the, 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 the physical path and the network path that the flows is traversing, the topology, additionally with the link capacity, uh, the packet level traces, which I was saying, both at the beginning and at the end, at the ingress and at the egress, and the performance information, uh, which is the delay associated to each packet at egress point, okay? Um, plus the metrics that we care about, which is the average flow and path delay. This is the output metric that we're asking people to, to compute. Um, so um, as I was saying, right, the challenge is, is, is I will say that a, a good approach to solve the challenge is to, to, to focus on the traffic because I believe that this is an important limitation of the current technology and fixing that will open the door to, to many new interesting use cases. So uh, we are generating two different types of traffic, constant bit rate and multiverse. Constant bit rate basically means that there is a burst of packets. Um, so the, this uh, reddish color, it's not a packet, but a burst of packets. Uh, no, sorry, this is one packet. Sorry, sorry, I was saying it wrong. This is one packet and each packet is sent at, at, at the same rate, okay? Uh, um, so, Sorry, each packet is sent at the same um, with the same gap between packets. So basically, it's kind of a periodic pattern, and what you get is a particular bit rate, right? If you average those packets over time, what you will get is a particular bit rate. Um, the second type of traffic is multiburst. The multiburst is a little bit more challenging and and quite more realistic. This is there are many studies which which suggest that this type of traffic is, is very common found on the internet and for many applications, which is you have a burst of packets and then a period of silence. And then another burst of packets, which exactly the same size, and then a, a period of silence. So what you get is packets per burst, uh, and then you have an on rate, which is a particular, um, um, the, the bit rate during this period is a particular rate, and then you have an interburst gap which is a silence between both, uh, both periods. And in both cases, you should be aware that packets have constant bit size. Uh, constant, uh, they have um, constant packet size. So all the packets have the same size, same the same size. This, we believe that this is not really important for um, the complexity of dealing with traffic and it's simplifying and uh, hopefully helping you uh, deal with, uh, with the challenge. So, the data sets in total, they have uh, they are half a tera in size. Um, and the, the reason for this is because we are publishing the packet traces. Um, and you can download the data sets now. We are have, oh, today we publish the data sets and everything uh, from this link. Uh, each data set is split into five gigabit files. So, which is quite large, right? We are offering many mirrors, but we believe that, that the data set is very large. And we build data set in such a way that you can just download one file, one gigabit file, and you can start participating. And actually you will get a very good data to start coding and testing new solutions. Then of course, if you want to win the challenge, download everything and train it with everything because this can give you an edge, right? But if you want to start participating and start seeing how you can improve Roundnet Fermi, or you, you want to, to, to start testing a solution from, from, from your own, with one uh, five gigabytes, that's enough for, for you to test. Okay, and now some, um, some uh, administrative information. So um, we will finish the, the challenge is open until October 2nd. And what we will do is we will evaluate the participant solution on a test data set. Uh, this test data set, we will only release, of course, the input labels and the output labels will be hidden. So you will take your solution, you will uh, use the test data set to produce the output labels, and you will send us the output labels, and we will check which is your accuracy. 
Of course, this test data set will follow similar distributions to the training data set, which is what we have released. And we will have an evaluation phase of 15 days, which is made automatically through an evaluation platform. And we will use MAPE to rank participants. So the winner will be the one with uh, the lowest MAPE. And you will see the, the your ranking in real time. So you will be able to, to you will have the test data set. You will be able, you will be able to send through the path platform your output labels and you will see your ranking in real time with respect to your uh, competitors. And then you are free to change something if you want, uh, and then send another um, set of output labels and see how your ranking changes. So we believe that this is a fun way to, to, to participate. After the evaluation, we will have a provisional ranking with the scores of all the teams. So we will show the map, the final map of all the teams, and we will ask the top five teams to send us the source code of the proposed solution plus a short repo, which can be just one page. We are not asking for more, explaining a little bit how your, your proposal works. And we will validate the top five solutions uh, to check that they comply with all the rules. I mean, this is a necessary process, but so far we didn't have an issue in the past. So I'm not anticipating uh, any, any we are not, I'm not anticipating any issue. And something very important, which is uh, that we will respect your privacy and your, not privacy, sorry, your uh, intellectual property. So if you believe that you will like your solution to be under an NDA, uh, we are we will be happy to, to sign an NDA uh, and you will re retain all the intellectual property of your solution. If you prefer to open source your solution, that's also fine. So again, it's up to you uh, what better uh, fits you. We are happy to sign an NDA for you to send your, your solution uh, or you can publish it open source, uh, whatever you prefer. So I'm getting at the end of the presentation. Uh, as I was saying, Roundnet Fermi uh, is proposed as a baseline. You can extend it. And this is the main resources, right? The baseline, data set, a quick start, a quick start tutorial, and the mailing list. You are free to send any question you may, ha you may have. Um, what we expect from you, if you are willing to participate, uh, is the source code of the proposed solution at the end, and a short report, one page describing the solution. And what we expect is to produce the first network digital twin, which is trained with a data set from a real network, which is uh, has never been done in, in, in the past uh, or, or in the literature or in, in academia. This is the timeline of the challenge and all the dates. The important dates that are that now you can register. Please note that registration is mandatory. You can go through that link and register your team. And uh, October 2nd will be the evaluation. Okay, and the data sets are already public, so you can start uh, now. So this is kind of a summary. So if you want to participate, which hopefully you want, you, you just need to register on the challenge website, download the data set, just the first file, and download the baseline, run it Fermi, and then you can start uh, coding. And um, now what we have is a live demo that um, Carlos will, will do, uh, and he will show how to download the data set, how to train with Ramnet Fermi, and even how to produce, how to make some changes in the into Ramnet Fermi that that if that will help you improve a little bit the mapping. Okay. So kind of the first step on the challenge. Um, an idea because there are many other ways to, to do that. So but I think that I prefer to make if you have any question now and then we will uh, move to, to Carlos. But we should allow Carlos to to explain this for 15, 15 minutes, more or less. Uh, thank you so much. I don't see any questions currently in the Q&A. As we are waiting for the questions, maybe I would say that Carlos, please go ahead, show us the demo. And everyone, uh, please, if you have a question, comment, you have the Q&A to put your questions and you have the chat. Okay, cool. All right, uh, thank you, Albert. Thank you, Thomas. So just a second for a start. Okay, so hi, my name is Carlos Gomez and I'm a PhD student at the Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya. And I'm also part of the team behind uh, the this year's Graph Neural Networking Challenge. So what I wanted to do in this demo is um, show you the repository uh, where we have loaded the baseline um, for this model, um, for this um, challenge. 
which also acts as a quick tutorial and a quick start uh, for any participants. Now, the first thing that you should do when you clone the repository is to basically follow the steps on the quick start that will tell you how to set up the Python environment, download the data set, and train the baseline model. Um, now, for the, uh, for the sake of the demo, due to time constraints, I'm going to skip over these steps. And instead, what I wanted to focus on is explaining in detail how we currently process the samples from its raw form into a format that can be then used um, to use to train uh, the machine learning models. So in our case, since we use TensorFlow, how to generate the TensorFlow data set. So just um, as a head up, heads up, so before this demo, what I have prepared already is first of all, the Python environment, and which can be done easily by following the structures in the readme, which is just running these two lines in the terminal. And the other thing I've done is already have the data set uh, pre-downloaded. So in case, uh, in your case, when you download the data set, what you have to do is follow the this link in the readme, which shall take you to this website over here. Um, this website contains a lot of information about um, how the data is generated, uh, basically the information that Albert has just told you in the presentation, and I think even a bit more. But in order to download the data sets, simply you can um, do so from the mirrors um, we present at the beginning of the website. If we open one of these mirrors, uh, you'll see that there's um, quite a few amount of files. However, the most important of them all is the first one without a number. The reason why is because basically this zip contains the entirety of the data set with the exception of the packet traces. Uh, as Albert just said, um, these packet traces are quite large. Uh, and while they're very useful, um, you don't need them to start. Um, and in fact, we encourage you to start downloading the first, uh, the first um, file and start working with that while the um, reminder of the data set is downloading. And in fact, for running the baseline, you only require um, the first um, zip file. So um, just as just to, know, to indicate, um, as I said before, um, I have already the data set pre-downloaded, so I don't spend um, a couple hours on that. So um, let's jump into how we generate um, samples. So in order to parse samples, um, what we use is the data generator script within the data folder in the repository. So basically, as I said, the idea behind the script is to parse samples from its raw form in the files into a format that can be used by the TensorFlow library. And the first thing you'll notice is that in order to parse the samples, um, you'll need to work with another library, which is called the DataNet API library. Now, this is a library that is included with your data sets when you download them. And when running the script, you don't have to worry too much about it in the sense that um, the script is already um, designed to load the appropriate versions of the DataNet API when you load the data set. But as the name implies, basically, this is an API which um, covers how to retrieve all the data from the data sets in the file. So um, this script works um, by three functions. So the first and the main function is the input function. So the idea is that the input function uses a TensorFlow um, function called the from generator function. Basically, the from generator function, what it allows is to, oh, sorry. No, yeah, okay. So what it allows is to basically define a TensorFlow data set um, by, by defining first a Python function, which acts as, as a generator and yields these samples one by one. So basically, this allows us to create a data set um, quite clearly, uh, quite, quite simply. It, in this function, we will also define the signature of the data set. So basically, this is the format that the data set should um, follow. Um, once generated. So basically, this includes um, the inputs, and which in our case we have defined as a dictionary. So it includes the keys of the dictionary and also the shape, um, the different values of the dictionary um, will follow. So in order to use the from generator um, function, we need to define a function that um, returns the samples processes um, in one by one as a generator, which is the self named uh, generator function. So here, how it works is that it loads um, the data set using the DataNet API um, class from the library with the same name. And basically, this, um, this class instance just acts as a wrapper, which then we can iterate through in order to obtain samples one by one. In this case, we use a for loop in order, 
and then use the other function we have defined the get network decomposition function to process these samples and then um, return them back. Now, for the sake of the demo, I'm going to do the following change. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do here is just limit the amount of samples we're going to process in this demo. And this is just for the sake of time, because I have limited amount of time for doing this presentation. Um, this is not a change you have to worry about um, for your own solutions. Now, the final um, function, uh, the largest um, I have to comment, is the get network decomposition. So as described, this um, function takes one sample as an input and returns one um, a one machine um, sample ready to use by TensorFlow as an output. So roughly, it is structured as follows. Uh, first, we load from the sample um, all the relevant um, data structures. So we include the network topology, the directed matrix, and the routings. Then what we do is extract all the relevant link and flow features. So for example, in the first loop, what we do is we go through the network and obtain all the relevant links and store them in the links um, dictionary. Then uh, we do the same for the flows. So we iterate through all the possible flows in the network. Um, we identify each flow by the source and destination device in the network. And since there can be multiple flows that share the same search and destination pair, we also then differentiate it between them using the local flow ID. And just as before, we extract, we extract all the relevant features and store them back in the flows dictionary. And then the next um, set of code, what it tries to do is build a hypergraph, which what it basically means is that it tries to understand the relationship between the links and the flows um, by using the flow routings. And basically, this hypergraph is defined as multiple um, lists of indices, which is the link to path and the path to link um, lists. And once all the information is extracted, um, the function uh, packages all together um, into the output. Um, so in this case, into uh, a dictionary. The same dictionary we seen back in input function that it follows the same structure. And basically, there's here all the flows are ordered so that across all the different features, uh, the indices of each feature um, um, basically match um, the same flows. So to avoid um, data to be um, messed up. So uh, basically, pretty much this is the structure of the data generator script. Now, in order to understand it better, uh, we believe that it is best to use an example of how what what steps should we follow if we wanted to add a new feature. So basically, the new feature um, we're going to add in this demo is basically information related to the interpacket gap. So the interpacket gap is measured as the time passed between two consecutive packets. Because, and this is very useful information because it gives us um, information about the nature of the flow, of how regular or irregular it is. Now, the interpacket gap is not something that we give you directly in the samples. It's something that all participants, the participants who want to get it and have to extract it manually by first extracting the packet timestamps, which uh, they do have, and then um, doing the operations into it in order to obtain the IPG. So what happens if we want to add this information? So the, most of the changes you'll see that are um, composed inside the get network decomposition function. So the first thing we want to do is actually load the packet traces because this is something that in the baseline it is not done. And this can be done simply by the following call to the API, where we call the function get packets info object. And now we we'll restore that information inside the packet info matrix variable. So the next step is that we have to go through the loop that um, identifies all flow features. So the first thing we have to do is retrieve the flow packet trace. Trace the packet traces for the given flow we are currently studying, which can be done as follows. Basically, we refer to the variable with the packet information, and we use the source, destination, and local flow ID in order to retrieve the packet trace uh, for the, the current flow. As you can see here, we also have an index zero. Um, this is because the flows can also be identified through the, through the quality of service. Uh, however, this is a non-issue uh, because in this data set, um, all flows will have the same value quality service of zero. So for the sake of the participants, you only have to remember um, to add this index um, to avoid uh, the code from crashing. And otherwise, um, you don't have to worry about it. So here in flow packet info, now we have a Python list 
which will have information for each packet, and each packet will be presented through a tuple um, containing um, basically information such as the timestamp, it was generated, or the packet size. So the first thing we want to actually do is to filter out the timestamp, and we can do so with the following line, which basically just means for each tuple, we retrieve only the first element. And then to obtain the IPG, um, this can be done trivially through the use of a NumPy uh, um, operation um, as follows, which basically what we are doing is that for each um, timestamp of a packet, we are subtracting it, the timestamp from the packet sent before in order to get the difference. Now, the issue here is that we have a sequence of IPGs, which on itself is not really useful. So in order, to, in order to make it useful, we have to summarize it in some way, such, such as like, for example, obtaining the mean or obtaining the variance or the percentiles. So that's what, what I'm gonna precisely going to do. So inside the flows dictionary, where I'm introducing the information for the current flow, I'm gonna add the new fields in order to obtain the IPG um, and derived matrix. So for example, the mean of the IPG values, uh, we also the variance and even the percentiles, which in this case, I just chosen to extract all the possible percentiles. So um, before we end the changes to this function, we now that we have extracted the features, we just have to make sure that the function returns it. So we go to the final data structure, uh, which is the, basically the output of the function. And we have to add the fields um, to now to make sure that the new features are returned, which we'll do with the foreign lines of code, where we'll add um, the new features as the flow IPG mean, flow IPG bar, and flow IPG percentiles. So with this, we have covered all the changes necessary um, inside the um, get network decomposition function. Before we finish, we still have to, however, to do one final change, that is to update the signature within input function to reflect the the new features we have ext extracted. And this is simply by adding the following fields, just making, you have to make sure that the key values reflect the same key values as the output of the previous function and the shape of the tensor spec also matches. So with this, uh, we should be good to go. So what I'm going to do now is run the script in order to generate a few samples with the updated um, data generator script. So while that works, one thing I want to warn you about is that the moment you start analyzing packet traces, um, the runtime of the script is going to increase significantly. And that's just because of the amount of data available in these packet traces. Um, so take that in mind in case you first try the baseline, you see it works uh, pretty quickly without um, adding packet traces and then um, the runtime increases significantly. So let's hope um, this should end um, relatively soon. And yeah, just a bit more. Okay. And finally, in order to verify our results, what we're gonna do is open Python in the terminal. And I'm just gonna load the data set and I'm gonna query one of the new input features. So for example, I'm going to query the IPG mean. And as you can see, it works perfectly. We have obtained the mean for all the flows within the first sample in the data set. In this case, there were 112 flows. If we wanted to do the same, for example, for the percentiles, we can query the percentiles. And it works just as fine as well. So basically, this covers um, the demonstration. And for any more questions, uh, this example I've just shown you is also present in the README, as well as other information. So please check out the README we have included in the repository. Um, you can also send us an email through the emails we provide in the presentation, or even just now, um, just now you can ask us questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, uh, Carlos, for the wonderful demo. And right now, I would like to invite my colleague, Vishnu. Hi, Vishnu, good afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Yes, good afternoon. Mm, let's see. So the, it's a very interesting demo. Thank you so much, Carlos and Albert. It's a pleasure to see your base. Uh, it's a very great, great example of moving from simulated data to real data, as you, as you correctly pointed out. Uh, I don't, I don't see questions. So let me ask, let me ask certain questions. Mm, the, the data generation that you explained, Carlos. Is it uh, is it an optional step or is it a mandatory step for a participant? So so I, I register now 
I'm a participant now. What should I do first? Is it the steps that you explain that you that I do first, or is there something else that I have to do first? Okay, so once you come to a repository and you read the readme, um, you'll see quickly that there's like a section which it's called Quick Start, and basically that covers what we believe are the fundamental steps, which is downloading the data set, generating the samples from the raw samples into like the TensorFlow friendly um, format and then training and evaluate, evaluating the model. Um, these steps are really detailed in the readme. We cover the exact lines in the terminals you have, uh, you have to input in the terminal to run. And that should be your first step. If for whatever reason you cannot download the data set, let's say, for example, you have uh, low internet access or you don't have a lot of disk, disk space, uh, the repository um, already comes in, included with um, samples pre-processed in the same way um, that the baseline is expecting. Um, you can work with that um, as a start, but we do not recommend that your final solution is based on that because in that case, you're limited to the features that we're using on the baseline. And maybe the participants, uh, you want to extract new features that you believe to be more relevant. And so, yeah, so the first steps is follow the quick start in the readme and just to make sure that it works. And from there, you should try to experiment and add new features or applying changes to the model. Got it, yes. So so when you say when you say adding features, is the in the packet gap is a good example? What, what, do, you, what, are, what do you mean by adding new features? Sure, by adding new features, uh, what we mean is just um, dimensions that the model or information aspects that the model can use in order to obtain better predictions of the flow delay. So for example, features in the current baseline includes like, for example, the, um, the packet size, um, the number of packets generated per flow, or the average um, bit rate for, for that flow. Or in the case of the network, for example, the link capacity. So here, the interpacket gap can be used to extract new features, like for example, the IPG mean, and which can help the model to better understand how the flow actually, the nature behind the flow, and how that will then impact the per packet delay um, of its of its own packets. Let mm -hmm. me complement what Carlos said. So yes, adding the interpacket gap as a feature is a good starting point. I see, I see. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can I ask you, uh, uh, Albert, you, you already mentioned that there are uh, small uh, small chunks of the data set which could be used, right? So you don't need the entire uh, 500 GB, but maybe small, pack, small chunks of it could be used. Um, so in the, in the sam uh, the code that you have do you do you uh, where where do you where do i as a participant when i use the code uh, or when i write this code to pick up the data set and use it where do i tell it not to take the 476 gb but a small chunk how can i do that i believe that this is a good question for carlos who is our expert in tensorflow so carlos so basically, um, in the case of the participants, um, I'm gonna share my screen again so I can see the, the download page, right? So basically the data set, you can think that it is split on two, like the packet traces and everything else. The everything else is quite small. It only takes, um, you can see only 14 megabytes. And then, uh, but of course includes everything but the packet traces. Now the packet traces, we had to split them we couldn't have it all in one compressed file because it was too big for the hosting um, website in order to upload it. So what we did is that we split it into, I think, 43. Okay, so 43 um, compressed files. So roughly every compressed file will have um, the packet traces for around 100 samples. Um, you can download them partially. Like maybe you can download maybe one of the packet traces files and you'll have the packet traces for 100 samples. Um, so you can work partially in that sense, right? If maybe once you want to work with packet traces, maybe you can download one zip, which is enough to understand their structure and maybe try to 
get information about the distribution. Um, but of course, what we want to emphasize is that the more we believe that the more information you have uh, as the participant, the better. So um, uh, even if it's good for a start to start working by downloading only a few of the packet traces files, enough to sample enough some sample enough part of the data set to obtain the distributions, the final solution should be to shut up access to the all the packet traces we have made available. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um so uh let me see is it necessary asif is asking is it necessary to use tensorflow can we use uh, other libraries i'm unable to understand role of gnn here <laughs> okay yeah. yeah so let, let me ask to the the first question the the you are free to use any library you choose or you prefer you are not uh forced to use tensorflow you are not forced to use to use roundnet fermi you if you prefer to use PyTorch, that that's fine then uh, the role of gnn so a very important input of the network digital twin is the topology of the network the topology of the network is a graph and in the data set we have different topologies so the the, the role of the gnn is to understand how uh, this topology and how this topology affects the delay of the packets okay so this is the role of the gnn here because fundamental networks fundamentally are graphs and because they are graphs one of the best techniques to understand graphs are gnns now it is true that now the main challenge is okay now we understand the network topology now we understand routing this is has been already solved in the state of the art now the problem is we don't understand traffic uh, we don't understand traffic at the packet level which is the real right in, in reality traffic is not Poisson traffic is a set of packets and this is what we're asking participants to this is the main challenge right to understand traffic mm -hmm. thank you so much how can gnn be used for training the configuration traffic data oh basically it's asking somebody is asking what what is the approach followed when you make uh, the model i believe yes uh yes so what we do is it, the way roundnet works is we take the topology and we transform it because there is a, certi a particular transformation into another graph but there is a graph which is fundamentally the topology and now over this topology we will have traffic flowing the through the topology so and the traffic will be flowing from one node of, from the graph to another node of the graph so what we'll do is we will initialize the hidden states of the nodes of the origin of the node that represents the origin of the traffic with a description of that traffic meaning that this node is generating this amount of traffic then if you the way GNN works, there is something which is called the message passing neural network, which is a type of neural network we use. And in the message passing, we will encode how the traffic is flowing through the different links. And then at, this is kind of a simplification, but at the end, we will have a hidden state in a particular node, which is the destination node. And this hidden state has been transformed through the message passing phase over the topology. And this hidden state in, uh, has information about the delay of those packets. So hopefully. Mm, thank you. Uh, so Albert, just, just to add to that question, do you have a link, per link information or the uh, path level information? Uh, the path level information. So at the, at the input of Rownet, you have this flow has these packets and will follow exactly this path. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Aliyu says that he's unable to register. <laughs> yes, okay. So yeah, please take a look. Yeah. Why? Okay. Aliyu, I have copied this in the internal uh, Slack, and I'm pretty certain that we will fix that in in uh, quickly. All right, thank you. Uh, can you explain about DataNet API? Abubakar, yes. yeah. So DataNet API is another uh, another library that we offer to participants. It's not mandatory. It's an, an API, a Python API, to parse the data set. The data set is very large. It has a particular structure. So 
we are not asking participants to understand the whole format, but rather you can use data and API and you will be able to read the samples super easy. Now, again, if you don't want to, do, to use data and API, that's also fine. We have also documented how is the format of the data set and you are free to use any other tool that you prefer. So we are always trying to facilitate the participation, giving you the right tools, but we are never mandating or forcing you to use those tools. Uh, so I bet the, the data net API has some documentation. Is, yeah. is, it, is it already there in your list? It is already there. Yeah. Oh, both okay. both the documentation for data net API plus the documentation of the format. If you don't want to use data net API and you want to access the data set, let's say raw. Great. Thank you. Uh, topologies are static or can we change the, is it dynamic? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So, um, Let's, let's focus on a particular row of the data set, okay? In one row, the topology is static, meaning that we choose a particular to topology. We choose a particular configuration, which at the end is the path of the flow. And then we choose a particular set of flows and each flow has a particular set of packets. Then we send all the packets through that fixed topology, through that fixed routing, and then we measure the delay of the packets at the end. Now, next row. In the next row, you may have a different topology and a different configuration because we want to build a network digital twin of a network. What we are doing is training a neural network to understand what a computer network is. And we want this network digital twin to be able to answer to questions regarding computer networks with an arbitrary configuration, an arbitrary topology, an arbitrary traffic. So you can use it in any other network you want. I wanted to add one thing, however, is that the, besides the routers, which can change, um, the topology behind the traffic generators connected to the switch, which then are connected to the routers, um, that the, the switches and the traffic generators, that remains constant. That is in constant across all times. What it can change is how the different routers are connected to the switches. And that's a great point. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I think, uh, let me, let me ask a practical question. <laughs> so, do you do you in your in your experiments uh, do you use GPUs and what kind of GPUs does participant need? As a participant, if I need to use GPUs, what kind of GPUs do I need? Of course, yeah. ITU ITU provide GPUs. It's free of cost. You can contact us. Uh, you can write to us, and we will provide GPUs free of cost for participants. But but what type of GPUs do you feel uh, when you when you in your experiment and yeah, maybe this this one is for carlos too yeah uh the short answer is that we have not used cpus uh and gpus in order to train our model um this is just because of the particularities of our graph model um it relies a lot in a lot of operations that are simply faster in the cpu than in the gpu so overall we haven't seen like a a uh, big step up, step, step up when using GPUs. So we decided to just keep it on the CPU. Um, of course, if you, if a participant wants used to another model um, from scratch, maybe those models uh, will benefit more from a GPU than ours. Uh, but yeah, in, at least in our baseline model and the models we work on, uh, we haven't found um, the benefit of using a GPU or at least a significant benefit. Yeah, actually, let me complement what uh, Carlos said, because this is a very interesting topic, actually. So because of the nature of GNNs, typically you don't get a huge acceleration uh, on, on using GPUs. That's why, actually, building hardware accelerators for GNN is an, open, is an open research topic right now. And it's actually a very interesting research topic with a, quite a big market, right, if you succeed. So yeah, I, I, I'm leaving the idea there. Yeah, and just, yeah, just uh, sorry, and one small clarification, the operation that makes it hard to run is, for example, the, the gather operation. That's like an operation that our uses a lot. And the problem is that since it's not sequential, GPUs don't like it. But this is good, right? So if you are participating in this challenge with your, you don't need a uh, very specific hardware. With your, you, you, will, you will not get any particular advantage for having a specialized hardware just by having CPU, that's enough. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there is a request for reference. Any paper to understand? I think I can answer it. In, in the BNN UPC site, there is a lot of reference information. Uh, Albert, would you like to add anything, please? Yeah, we will. We will post. Uh, there is already posted a, a report on Roundnet Fermi, 
uh, and you will find there all the information you need to understand how to use GNN in Intel Core. Thank you very much. Is it permitted to use Ignition Framework? Yes, it is permitted to use Ignition Framework. So you, for those of you that you don't know, Ignition Framework is a framework that we also build. Build is an open source framework where you can code a GNN without the need of knowing anything of TensorFlow or PyTorch. Zero TensorFlow, zero PyTorch. You just define the structure of the of the of the GNN using a declarative language, which is basically a YAML. Which I mean, if you don't know anything about TensorFlow or PyTorch, anyone can write a YAML. You need to specify which GNN architecture you want to use and how does it work and uh, Ignition will build the code for you and it works very well. So yes, you are free to use Ignition and actually you are free to use any other framework you, you want. Thank you very much. Very exciting challenge. Thank you for laying out uh, so nicely out there and uh, taking us through the code, Carlos. Thomas is here, back to you, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Vishnu, for moderating the Q&A and thanks to you, uh, Beto and Carlos, for making time, presenting, having this demo, we did appreciate. So a huge announcement, the challenge, the Graph Neural Network Challenge 2023 has launched. You can register. Please make sure that you register on both uh, platforms. We have the IQ platform and the BNNUPC platform. Make sure that you join the mailing list on the BNN platform. Uh, and of course, so much prizes to win. The first winner for the Graph Neural Network Challenge will receive 2,000 euros from BNN UPC, and the second winner will receive 500. But we also have 1,000 Swiss franc from ITU. So good prizes there. Please register, join, and participate in this problem statement. Another announcement is that we have several other problem statements that are open. Prizes, you can check on the IT website. We have another. Uh, another webinar next week, so please join us. And of course, we have the AI for Good uh, coming up this week. You can join either in person or on online. We are looking forward to your participation. So at this point in time, I would like to finish uh, this webinar. Thank you so much uh, to Abbott and Carlos for the presentation, Vision for Moderation, and everyone else for joining. We hope to see you soon and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one on one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good.